for being here. Amongst all of the events you could have been at, it's really nice to see you here for our event, which is From Conflict to Collaboration, Transforming Institutions for Gender Equality. I hope you've had a really great week at CSO. My name is Andrea Salguero. I'm the Director of Public Affairs for the Baha'i Community of Canada. I will be the co-moderator for today's panel discussion uh, alongside my colleague, Ava Motazian, and she's the Director of Public Affairs for the Baha'i Community of Australia. So this is a co-sponsored event between our two communities. And one of the things that really unites Canada and Australia is that both of our countries have a process of reconciliation underway at all levels of society at this time. And so I'd like to begin today's panel with an acknowledgement that we are on the traditional lands of the Lanape people. And Manhattan is actually the Lanape word for hilly place. And the area where we are used to be a wooded area with an abundance of wildlife and sandy shores. And so today amidst the skyscrapers, we honor the Lenape people, their culture, their teachings, and their land. And the focus of today's event is on this idea of institutional transformation. And when we're deciding on what to discuss, we really thought of institutions because um, all of these diverse institutions in our society, if we think of those related to education, governance, finance, Commerce, these are powerful shapers of behavior. And these institutions often provide the social spaces where women are either encouraged to greater and more meaningful participation in public life, or conversely, these are the spaces where women encounter significant barriers to participation. Institutions are also more than the sum of their parts. They're more just than the aggregate of the individuals that work within them. And so, we can see institutions as a reflection of our culture and the values that lead to their creation and the values that sustain them. So what we've heard at CSW this week is that there's a collective challenge ahead of all of the states, really ahead of all of us in this room here today, and that's to profoundly transform institutions that historic, have historically been founded on patriarchal values such as control, domination, competition, and to transform them into institutions that are founded on new principles, um, including a strongly held commitment to gender equality. So the panelists you will hear today were invited to bring their diverse experiences to bear on some reflection questions, including how can institutions and the broader cultures that sustain them be recast according to principles of equality and justice? And how can a range of institutions not only permit, but actively foster the advancement of women. So today's discussion, we're hoping to keep it to about an hour and leave lots of time to have a facilitated discussion afterwards and where you'll be able to ask questions. And for those on Zoom that are joining us, welcome. And you can write your questions in the chat that's being actively moderated. After the presentation, uh, there'll be some light refreshments so you can stay and chat with each other. I will now open the floor to Beatrice Maillet for opening remarks. Thank you very much for being here today. Though I understand you'll have to leave a little bit early. Um, Beatrice Maillet is the Minister, Counselor, and Legal Advisor at the Permanent Mission of Canada to the United Nations. Ms. Maillet recently served as Senior Legal and Team Leader on UN Reforms, Budget, and legal affairs in the office of the president of the 74th session of the United Nations General Assembly. Previously as a career diplomat, Ms. Maye served as the director general of legal affairs and deputy legal advisor at Global Affairs Canada. She held other senior positions, including an executive director of criminal security and diplomatic law and director general of the consular policy bureau. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Andrea, and thanks again for welcoming me again this year uh, to this lovely uh, place and this uh, very dynamic conversation. It was such a, a great event last year, and I'm happy to be back uh, in um, with you today. So this year, I hope you all have felt the electricity in the air with the CSW uh, starting, and we are really at an inflection point on gender equality 
and multilateralism. Um, it's not a secret that it's an unstable and scary world and for many, um, especially for women and girls. In too many places we see um, what, when safety and security are threatened, we also see the backsliding on uh, fundamental rights for women and girls. And I just have to think, for example, about IET or Afghanistan or other places. Our collective challenge, you mentioned, Andrea, is true. And um, we, Canada, remain steadfast that gender equality is not negotiable. Uh, it is a fundamental human right that must be protected. And to do so, we need to work with civil society, the private sector, young leaders, um, indigenous and, uh, peoples and others to transform institution, ensuring that they are fit for purpose and empowered to deliver an ambition and important new weight. For institution to effectively deliver on gender equality, they must be stepped in the tenets of intersectionality, non-discrimination, diversity and inclusion and transparency and accountability. This is uh, why, again, Canada at the um, CSW this year is advancing several priorities, but including advancing human rights and counting and encountering anti-gender backlash. We were actually having a lunch on this with a few countries at lunchtime and strengthening institution and social protection systems. We can all agree that the public institution play a critical role, as you were mentioning, either way. And so, uh, but I am a believer that it is an advancing gender equality when all the ingredients are there. And we also know that strengthening social protection system goes hand in hand with economic resilience and empowerment. So it's clear that empowering organization working on gender equality um, is vital to strengthen institution more broadly. And they can definitely play our catalyst role for change. Change in laws, in attitudes, in norms and practices. And broadening and maintaining the civic space for progress on women and girls' rights, but also for women's voices. I find the most interesting and fabulous part about CSW is that I hear voices that we don't usually hear. And those are important. There are more nuanced. They're, they're ingrained in, in fact and in knowledge. And uh, I think it's really important to listen. Uh, this is why we've uh, Canada has provided flexible and dedicated funding to equality seeking organization and movement through the Women Voices and Leadership Program, which has now reached over 1,500 women's rights organizations since it's launched in 2017. Uh, we've also established other funds that have been critical in leveraging um, a giving platform for women advocates. While supporting grassroots organizations is part of the equation, we also have to not to forget the importance of the UN as a centerpiece of their role-based international system. Maybe like me, on Monday morning, when you were sitting in the GAR and you were counting the fourth male speaker and the fifth male speaker before we heard this wonderful voice by this um, woman activist from India, you kind of were wondering. And uh, I hope that, um, you know, it just shows that we still have a lot of work to do but we can do that work together. We were very pleased to hear the Secretary General launching this new UN system-wide gender equality acceleration plan on um, March 8th, and we've been inquiring on how it's gonna be put in action. But we are also um, pleased to hear some voices who are working from the inside. I was having lunch with Shauna Holne, the Canadian expert on the International Civil Service Commission which is a non-known body of the UN, but she's been quite active actually in making sure that the UN would adopt a uh, parental leave um, a program across all institutions that would give the same to all men or women parents and giving opportunities. So we can do things for gender equality in all our little ways. Um, Finally, I should note that Ambassador Ray will be um, 
become the president of the Economic and Social Council as of the end of July uh, of this year uh, until next year, um, 2025. And we really look forward to uh, the opportunity to, um, as the president of ECOSOC, to also embrace Beijing plus 30 and the anniversary of the Declaration of Five Formal Nations. So um, really happy to be here today. Apologies if I will have to leave a little bit early, but again, looking forward to a great conversation. Thank you, Beatrice. It's wonderful to have you with us again. Um, and thank you to anyone who's joined us as well. Um, I wanted to also acknowledge the presence of uh, Lorraine Finlay, the Australian Human Rights Commissioner, um, who's also joining us online. Thank you. I know it's early. Um, um, speaking of human rights and, and the human rights that you also mentioned, the situation is, is so dire right now. I think in reconceptualizing what it means to be um, a human is really a key question that underlies a lot of um, the questions for gender equality. So let's also remember the humanity in, in everything that we're doing and the humanity of the struggle. Um, it is my pleasure to now introduce um, Dan Perel. So Dan um, is uh, representing the Baha'i International Community um, who are co-hosting this event, whose wonderful space that we're currently inhabiting. So thank you to all the staff who made everything happen. Um, so each year, the Baha'i International Community releases a statement on the priority theme uh, to stimulate thought and discussion around key concepts to influence the commission. This year, the statement is titled, Reimagining the Role of Institutions in Building Gender Equal Societies. Might see litter of pink as you as you uh, exit the building. So um, I would invite Dan now to um, to share a bit more, but just a little bit about Dan. So Dan joined the Baha'i International Community United Nations office as a representative in 2011. His areas of work include social and sustainable development, climate change, the environment, global citizenship, human rights, and the role of religion in society. Very small portfolio. He is formerly a global organizing partner of the NGO Major Group and chair of the NGO Committee for Social Development. Um, and in 2010, Dan received a JD from the University of Virginia School of Law and an MA in Law and Diplomacy from the Fletcher School at Tufts University and was admitted to the New York State Bar Association. Uh, Dan has also what worked. What part of abbreviated? <laughs> he, was, he was very specific. Um, but, but just just for one more thing, I'll, I'll finish this. He's worked with the International Service for Human Rights in Geneva, um, and the UN in Aceh, Indonesia, and other organizations in the Marshall Islands and Chile. So we're very pleased to have Dan. Thank you um, for embarrassing me uh, <laughs> and also allowing me to to, to share a few words. Um, so yes, it's really a delight to, to see so many faces here. Uh, and I love the CSW exactly as a uh, new voice. So I'll try to limit my remarks, but I did wanna offer um, just a few thoughts um, pertinent to this uh, statement, but maybe not exactly on this statement. First, as I was thinking about the questions, uh, the, the, the first thing that came to my mind are what are the qualities that currently underlie our institutions? What are the, the principles upon which those institutions seem to be founded? The second one is what would we want those qualities to be? If we erased all of the, the institutions, what would we rebuild? I mean, what would be the sort of the guiding lights of the new institutions? Third question then is how do we get from A to B, assuming they're not the same? And then fourth, I was going to talk a little bit about what's in the statement. So first, where are we? I mean, it, it, if somebody were to say, and I was actually gonna do a thing where I call on all of you to offer words, but I don't wanna put anybody on the spot. But if, if we were to say, what are some of the qualities and principles that seem to underlie the, the institutions of society? They might be something along the lines of a few of the words that Andrea said earlier, control, domination, competition. Others I was thinking about are accumulation. So wealth and power accumulation. 
self-interest or, or at best constituency interests. If you think about what's right for my group. Um, Short-termism, the next election cycle is something that we often hear. 51% is something that I often think about. The, the goal seems to be in many of, of these uh, democratic countries anyway, to, to achieve 51%. And once you get there, you've, you've achieved what you need to. Authority, confidence, assuredness, sort of that, that projection of, of your rightness. This is like the qualities of, of leadership and institutions that seem to define much of the international order. And I would not associate these with what I would love to see. Uh, I might use a term like patriarchy, which is, you know, it has all kinds of baggage, but I think those are largely the qualities that seem to underlie that adjective. So then what is it that we would want in our decision-making? It could be things like solidarity, uh, long-term thinking, a whole of society approach, trustworthiness, generosity, compassion, empathy, and even a posture of learning. And what, what happens when you have a posture of learning is that you can say, I was mistaken, and I'm gonna try something different. Imagine if a politician said that today. I mean, that they're a flip-flopper, that, you know, it's, it's very difficult. And not just a, a politician, I don't mean to, to, to say it's only in that realm, but even, you know, a, a father uh, were to say I was wrong. Those are some very hard words for a father to say, especially in front of his children, I say as a father with children. Um, but also, you know, CEOs, really all of us, we're sort of, the, this, the culture within which we operate is one where we can't say I was wrong and I need to, to try a different approach. I think if we expect learning from our communities, it can't start from that place of attachment to our, our own perspective. So then how do we get there? Um, and I, I think that the way to get from where we are to where we need to be, it's, it's a little bit of a bootstraps problem where we need to use those qualities that we hope to achieve in order to uh, eviscerate ourselves, free ourselves from the qualities that we, have, we are already embedded in. So we need a learning approach in order to have a learning approach. We need trust in order for there to be trustworthiness. Uh, we need um, you know, these small steps, these small deeds of, of achievement in order to create big deeds of achievement. And we have this, this little problem, and I think that's often why we have such a challenge in achieving the outcomes we wish to see is that we're embedded within this culture of competition that doesn't really allow for a culture of cooperation. Um, and I think that that then maybe brings me to the statement. I can fast forward to that. And one of the challenges that we as an office have often tried to overcome, and we're, we're still trying to work on it, so actually your feedback is most welcome, is how do we introduce learning from the grassroots level into these spaces in a way that's meaningful? Across the street, often the way to do that is by having big numbers. We fed this many people, we had this many women enrolled, this many youth, and that's super important. There's nothing to, 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 I don't want to diminish the importance of quantitative analysis. But often the real changes that, that we have found in the Baha'i community are, are at the very local level. They're actually much more qualitative. It's about a very small process. It's about, if you read the statement, that first paragraph uh, where the, the men in this institution decided to serve the, the women in this institution in order that they could have the kind of consultation that they needed to have to advance their community and, and to address their needs. Now, it's that men being of service, which in that community in Zambia was a huge step forward. I mean, maybe we're a little privileged in, in this room where men are, are often seeing, seen serving others, but in other spaces, that's actually a huge step forward. But how do we share that in a way where someone can read it and say, wow, that is a huge leap. And it's very difficult because we want the big numbers. We want the, this is the UN, things have to be big, they have to be grand. And so I think what we've tried to do this time is to, to offer this small story of local change because ultimately that local change is the, the drop in the ocean. And with many of them, we have large changes, but share alongside the context of the things that we're talking about today, these bigger institutional questions, these fundamental principles and values that need to underlie society that maybe haven't thus far. Uh, and so I, I, maybe I'll leave it there with just this sort of dichotomy that we have of the, the real local level being the, the, the places of change, you know, the schools, the dinner tables, those are the real places of change. But then how do we get the UN to sort of internalize that in a way that is meaningful because we also don't want the UN to be trying to tell everybody what to talk about at dinner. That's not their whole, there's like the subsidiarity dimension as well. Um, and so maybe by trying to, to find these values, this, this knowledge that's happening at the local level and share it at the international and offer some suggestions, 
for what those cultures, those habits could look like if they were taking, taking place at the UN, maybe that's a way that we can offer a different model of learning and one that is characterized with it by the characteristics of empathy and compassion and not sort of competition and power. I'll, I'll leave it there, thanks. Thank you, Dan. I think that's that's also something I really appreciate about CSW is that it has the space for a high level discussion and at the same time being able to hear from grassroots and all the meaningful change happening in communities from the people that are witnessing it firsthand and, and bringing it forward too. I'd like to introduce our next speaker now. Um, her name is Jelena Bighorn, who's joining us virtually from Vancouver this morning. Hi, Jelena. Uh, Jelena is a Lakota activist and educator who believes in education as the practice of freedom. For over 17 years, she has worked in the public school system in British Columbia, Canada. She is continuing her studies through a Master of Arts degree in Educational Studies at the University of British Columbia, with a focus on addressing white supremacy culture in schools. Currently, she's a member of British Columbia Teachers Federation Executive Committee, which provides leadership to the 50,000 public school teachers in the province. Her lifeline commitment to decolonization and liberation is realized through her work. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, relatives, I, I wish I could be in this space with you so that I could greet you properly and, and to get to know you and to and collaborate even more and to hear more of your experiences. I do appreciate the opportunity to join you from this small corner of Canada. And um, I feel very, such, such gratitude to, to be in a space like this and to I'd want to honor each one of you for the work that you do, because I feel that in my small corner of the world, I, I am benefiting from the work that you are doing at the tables that you are at and the, the time that it takes, the sacrifices that you give to be away from your families to do this good work, it's, it's felt here. Thank you. Um, so there, there are many different hats that I wear and, and, and ways that I am trying to contribute to the empowerment of women, to decolonization and, and other other global movements that we see around the world. But I'm also a classroom teacher. And that is, I find where I gain my greatest strength. I just left the classroom and I can assure you that there were empowered young women <laughs> that I left behind me who will, who will carry on and they are already um, reaping the benefits of some of the global initiatives that um, different countries have taken. A few thoughts that I had around the, the questions that were given and they were magnificent because they really pushed me to think about how I have witnessed um, a different relationship between institutions and individuals. At the, at the BCTF where I'm an executive member overseeing all of these fantastic public school teachers, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of questions around how, how do we have a relationship with the employer in our circumstance? And what I try to bring from a Lakota indigenous perspective is the importance of relationality, that we are coming as relatives to remove that sense of, um, of, an, of an adversary, that we are coming into conflict. And I, I, I take that not only as a teaching, but what I know from in history, that when, when groups of people come together, it, we often hear of stories of conflict, but I actually hear stories of love. That in our in, in the Canadian context, we have a very unique group known as the Métis. These were Cree women who married French traders in such large numbers when they first arrived that they created a new culture. It was love that brought them together. It wasn't conflict. If we had had time to come to know each other's ways, that, that, that peace would have continued. So in, in the spaces that I'm in, at the tables that I'm at, I try to bring that relationality and it is it is making an impact um, at our we had a recent AGM with all of these teachers coming together and there was it was interesting to see that uh, one of the motions on the table was to ensure that men have a seat at the BCTF table because it's predominantly women 
and as we know, teaching is, and at least in Canada, is it predominantly a female uh, occupation? And so some of the, the male teachers felt that they lacked representation. So they wanted to ensure that they had a designated seat. And in the consultation, I tried to offer um, some insight again from, from an indigenous perspective that sometimes we have to follow nature. In fact, all the times so we have to follow nature and the natural rhythms that are present. And for women, we've been living in a winter time in the winter season for far, far too long. We are just starting to see those first early blooms of springtime emerge. And so I encourage the, the members at that space to, to let us have our season and, and to know that there will be a time for balance that, will, that it is coming, but give us, give us our season. And it was able to um, sway the room and we were able to continue with not having a male designated seat. So I think when, when there is understanding um, especially amongst the younger generation as to why it is important to empower young women. When that knowledge is there, they, there's a greater acceptance. I, I had a conversation with my young son once, like a few years ago, he was crying because he felt that all of the, the superheroes in his world were women. They're all girls. They have all the superpowers. Every show that he watches, every TV program, it's all women being celebrated. And so I, I had to have that conversation with him to let him know that historically, this has not been the case. And so once he realized that, and once I reminded him that he has Harry Potter, <laughs> <laughs> then, then he started to see the vision and was able to accept it. So it is in the classroom setting that that is where there is so much potential for creating that, that understanding and that knowledge. And what I encourage my students to consider is are in relation to power over who has power over who and it's a it's an, an assumption that there is a limited amount of power and that we are jostling to try to get a certain percentage I, I try to encourage them to consider that there's another kind of power there's a power too and that power is is limitless you could go build a bridge right now it might not function well and I might not want to step on it but you can you could go learn a language you could go uh, make a new friend. You can right wrongs. You There's so many things that we have the power to. And then I encourage them once they've gotten excited by that concept to consider an even more uh, impressive power is the power with. When we work together, that is when the true capacity, I believe, of humanity is is realized and recognized. And when with that power with, there are certain spiritual qualities that will be realized. We'll be able to trust one another. We'll be able to forgive one another. And that in itself, as an indigenous person coming from a country that is making incredible efforts to reconcile with the indigenous people, being able to forgive is such, um, it is such an empowering place to be. So these are just a few of the thoughts that I wanted to share in this space. Thank you for having me. And again, um, I honor the work that you are doing at that table because I feel that as a, as a classroom teacher, I am able to do the work that I am because you are you are protecting this space. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jelena. It's always great to hear these stories coming from the, the grassroots, from the stories from the classroom. And to think that these conversations are happening all across Canada is really a source of, of inspiration. So thank you. I want to, I want to introduce our next speaker now. Uh, we have with us today, Dania Bokhari. Uh, Dania is a Canadian lawyer and advocate for gender equity and migrant justice. As a former staff lawyer at the Barbara Schleifer Commemorative Clinic in Toronto, she provided legal services in immigration, refugee law, family law, and sexual assault law to women and gender diverse survivors of gender-based violence. In this role, she supported the clinic's law reform and policy advocacy work, including interventions of the Supreme Court of Canada and submissions before the Canadian House of Commons. Mania has supported clients in navigating complex and intersecting marginalization, such as poverty, homelessness, discrimination and precarious immigration status. 
Her legal practice is grounded in a trauma-informed, intersectional, anti-oppressive framework. Ania is currently pursuing a Master's of Law at Columbia University in New York, and she's joining us today as, as a delegate with Young Diplomats of Canada. This delegation aims to center the experiences of youth and advocate for the inclusion of youth and state responses to gender trauma. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, thank you so much, um, Andrea. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to say thank you, Andrea, again, and to the Baha'i Community of Canada for inviting me to participate in this event. Um, it's so lovely to be included here. Um, and I'm also very honored to be representing the Young Diplomats of Canada. Two of my other delegates are sitting across the table from me, Taylor and Zianna. Um, and uh, I really appreciate the Baha'i Community of Canada um, prioritizing youth engagement uh, in this forum. Um, so as Andrea mentioned, I, I am a lawyer and advocate for survivors of gender-based violence in Canada. I have worked closely with survivors who have experienced the multiplicity of forms of gender-based violence, including intimate partner violence, sexual assault and harassment, human trafficking, and forced marriage. I've also worked with survivors in navigating multiple legal systems, including the family law system, immigration and refugee, criminal and civil law systems. Uh, as we're getting to, you know, to the end of the first week of the commission, I, I'm sure uh, you, know, you may have heard conversations about gender-based violence at different panels and side events. And I want to thank you for your attention while I talk about this uh, issue that's really important to me, that's really important to the Young Diplomats of Canada. Um, and I, I want to take a little bit of a different approach to my opening intervention. Um, and I want to actually share a story. Um, and that story is a story of a girl, young girl named Kira and her mother, Jennifer. So Kira and her mother lived in the Oakville, Burlington area of Ontario, which is just outside of Toronto. Um, Jennifer described her daughter, Kira, as a bright light, sweet, innocent, spunky four-year-old with a bright future ahead of her. Jennifer had been separated from Kira's father, and Kira's father had been awarded visitation rights by the family court. During one of these visits on February 9th, 2020, Kira's father took her hiking at a well-known hiking spot called Rattlesnake Point in Hilton, Ontario. Later that day, police found both of their bodies at the bottom of a cliff. This was a case of murder-suicide committed by Kira's father who had an established pattern of physical and emotional abuse against Kira's mother, Jennifer. Prior to Kira's death, Jennifer had been fighting in family court to seek protection for Kira from her father's coercive and controlling behavior. In her family court case, Jennifer had disclosed the domestic abuse she experienced during the relationship and urged the court to suspend the father's ability to visit Kira. Despite the father's erratic and escalating behavior, the judge dismissed Jennifer's claims about domestic violence, stating that the history of abuse was not relevant to parenting and to custody of Kira. Jennifer has been quoted as saying, when we went to trial in my matter, I was before a judge with a background in labor and employment law, and he cut me off on the stand when I was talking about domestic violence. He told me, parent, uh, he told me that uh, domestic violence uh, is not relevant to parenting. Kira's death at the hands of her father sheds light on the consequences of family violence, the devastating impact of violence on children, and the role of the legal system in perpetuating gender-based violence. After Kira's death, her mother Jennifer conducted a significant amount of political advocacy and worked with several members of parliament to bring attention to the need to reform the criminal and family law systems. Her tireless advocacy resulted in the passing of Kira's law in May, 2023, and Kira's law basically requires family and criminal law judges to receive education on domestic violence and course of control and intimate partner and family relationships. The idea is that with this new training on intimate partner violence and course of control, judges will have a comprehensive toolbox of understanding of violence and will be better equipped to deal with these types of cases. So through judicial education on domestic violence, judges should have better tools to assess risk and make decisions that are best for children and that also keep mothers safe. I share Kira's story to highlight that gender-based violence is a patriarchy personified. 
It is a zenith of expression of control over the bodies and autonomy of women, mm -hmm. girls, and gender diverse communities. The reality is that there are thousands of Kiras and thousands of Jennifers in Canada and across the globe. Countless women and children have been failed by the legal system before Kira's law and after its passing. I also share Kira's story to ask and implore us to think about the urgency and immediacy by which we need to address gender-based violence and to consider how slow and incremental systemic change can be. How many women and girls have to be tortured and killed by gender-based violence before institutions are prompted to change? Between 2018 and 2022, the Canadian Femicide Observatory revealed that a woman or girl is killed in Canada every two days. That is every 48 hours. Statistics Canada has further reported that one in three women has experienced unwanted sexual attention and abuse in public. For years, countless civil society organizations, frontline service providers, and survivors of gender-based violence in Canada have been calling for the government to recognize gender-based violence as an epidemic. The World Health Organization had called gender-based violence an epidemic back in 2016. And in 2021, during the COVID pandemic, the UN referred to gender-based violence as a shadow pandemic. Finally, just this past August, the Canadian government has officially designated gender-based violence as an ep epidemic. Despite these developments, the reality is that there are certain communities of women, girls, and gender diverse people that are at high risk of gender based violence. This includes women with disabilities, Indigenous women, racialized women, trans and non binary women, and migrant women. The fact that these communities face higher risks of violence is due to the, to the discrimination and barriers they face in accessing social, economic, and legal services. As a result, any meaningful response to gender-based violence requires a transformation of multiple systems and sectors and the elimination of the enabling conditions that heighten the risk of violence, especially poverty. In reflecting on our horrific experience in the family court system, Jennifer has stated that in her experiences as a white upper middle class woman in family court was this difficult and traumatizing, then what must the experience be like for racialized women? Thank you. Thank you, Gania. That was a sobering reality um, that you shared. It's been really um, interesting to see across different sectors, uh, the legal sector, the education sector, um, and, and also at, at multilateral forums like the UN, um, how change really is possible. And we can yeah, really rise from the ashes of, of horrific experiences like that. I, I echo um, Andrea's comments earlier that CSW is really such a wonderful space where we can hear um, from the grassroots. And uh, it was wonderful to hear from, from Jelena. Um, and now I want to cross over to Western Australia where it's currently 4 a.m. <laughs> or something close to that. Uh, we are going to be shared, um, we're going to have two speakers join us uh, who will be sharing insights from a grassroots initiative that has been unfolding in Mossman Park, which is a town in Perth um, called the Sisterhood Initiative. Um, are we playing the video first? Yeah. So first, there is a, I think this is an initiative that when we were looking at you know, shaping this event, we thought it was really wonderful because it speaks to a reality that we're all familiar with out of a neighborhood. We're all part of a neighborhood. Um, and what's been happening there has been really exciting and it's created a lot of dialogue with the land council, uh, with the land council, with the local council. So first we have a message from the CEO of Mossman Park Local Council, Carissa Bywater. Carissa was appointed the Chief Executive Officer of the Town of Mossman Park in 2019. Her dedication and passion for the local communities which she has served has seen her lead all aspects of business, finance, and corporate strategy across Australia, including the Forbes Shire Council in New South Wales, City of Bayswater in Western Australia, and now the town of Mossman Park. Providing the Mossman Park community with lifestyle outcomes is what drives, influences, and rewards her every day. So we have a short message from her, um, and then we'll be joined by Faribault, who I'll introduce um, after.
When you hear the word institution, what do you think of? Do the words collaboration, equality and love come to mind? How can we change institutions and begin focusing to influence and relate to others? I'm the CEO at the Town of Mosman Park. We are a local government organisation in Perth, Western Australia. As CEO, my work is to enable a culture where people want to stay and for our work to contribute to a better society and planet. For all of us here, our industry is changing, our communities are changing, and we are changing. The 2023 Edelman Survey for Australia shows that trust in government, in media and business So we have to learn to be comfortable with not having all the answers and to enjoy curiosity, to reflect on and learn, to embrace diversity and encourage our people to do the same. But to do this, we need less. I trained as an accountant, so I like nice, neat balance sheets, but it's not the neatness and and the most clever who survive. It's the most adaptable and brave. I'm in local government because I care. And that helps me make meaning when things get tough, whether that's with my health or with my... ...self is pretty motivating. But I want to share something else I discovered about our work on culture. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals offers us a vision for a better world. One of these goals, number eight, is decent work. And our work on culture, improving employee health and wellbeing at Little Mozzie Park contributes to this goal. Goal five is gender equality and another is goal 17, partnerships. A good workplace culture aligns with these goals to foster equality and connection, to enable our community to do amazing things. The sisterhood is a beautiful example of what's possible when people come together, united by a common purpose. Thank you. Okay, fill in the blanks to your imagination. <laughs> um, uh, thank you to Carissa for, for, um, for that message. Um, and now introducing Faribor. Faribor Fanayan has been actively working in social cohesion in her community um, through educational endeavors over the last eight years in her local neighborhood of Mossman Park. She is the founder of Mossman Park Sisterhood, a Baha'i inspired organization that aspires to empower all, women of all ages and backgrounds to contribute to both material and spiritual transformation of individuals and communities. Faribor is passionate about how systematic educational processes can posit positively impact the lives of individuals and communities. Thank you for joining us, Faribor. Thank you so much. Good afternoon and loving greetings to each one of you from the women of Mosman Park who are sleeping right now. So um, you would have had more people on Zoom. So and deep gratitude to the Baha'i international community and the Australian and Canadian Baha'i communities for hosting this gathering and all the dignitaries and participants for your valuable time and contributions. Uh, before we start, I would like to show and pay my respects and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land I'm meeting on, the Wajak Nunga people, and also to pay our respects to the elders past and present. Thank you. Mosman Park Sisterhood um, was formed in December 2020, inspired by the story of the Atom, a refugee friend of ours, who sadly passed away in October 2020 due to the negative forces of society during the pandemic. The purpose of Sisterhood is to create a regular space where women of all backgrounds and ages can engage in discourses related to the material and spiritual well-being impacting 
their family, themselves and their community. So as the Awa shared earlier, that's the real uh, focus of what we do. It's empowering women to collectively come together and have deep consultations on what is the material and spiritual uh, reality of our community, of our family, of ourselves, and how can we make transformations. So at the heart of what we do is capacity building and this humble posture of learning, um, which was mentioned earlier, this learning process is quite key to our endeavors. Um, inspired by the Baha'i Faith's vision, where the world of humanity is likened to the human body, within a, every this organism of millions of cells, diverse in form of function, play their part in maintaining a healthy system. The principle, the key principle that governs the function of the body is cooperation. Its various parts don't compete for resources. Rather, each cell from its inception is linked to a continuous process of giving and receiving. Likewise, recognizing the nobility of every person removing all forms of prejudice and creating opportunities for everyone to connect, belong and contribute is at the heart of sisterhood and our interaction at the grassroots with all involved. So we also have um, a group of us who really are motivated by the following quote from the Baha'i writings. And it's so humbling to be in this space and I can't express the deep gratitude that uh, we feel being able to present. And this quote shares, be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age you live in and center your deliberations on its exigencies and requirements. So every consultation, every deliberation we have, whether it's with institutions, whether it's with friends, whether with at the family dinner, we have that at the forefront of our mind. Sisterhood is responding to the needs of and aspirations of women in Mossman Park. So although we have a really clear socioeconomic disparity in our community, sisterhood has allowed to remove that and also for women of all backgrounds, especially our de indigenous community to come connect together and connect. We have our spaces where the women in retiree villages are interacting with the girls from junior youth groups and the youth in our community. And it's just so lovely to see how this intergenerational learning and interaction is unfolding. At the moment, uh, there are over 130 women with who we're involved with, many with conversations, core activities and social action initiatives. Some of the social action initiatives, as you could appreciate, have emerged naturally from the grassroots. It's the women coming together, consulting, reading the reality, and then realizing, okay, let's try and address this through doing this. So things like mental health, isolation, supporting single moms to send their children to school and providing all the necessary resources for the building the capacity of the women of Mosman Park. So one of the questions we are following and learning about at the moment, how can each person contribute to community life and become an active protagonist in the process? So we need to have reconceptualization of the culture Earlier, there was mention about how do we, you know, what does it look like? How what do, what does the new culture or the new system need to look like? And the shift from the power of status, titles, control, domination, greed, and to the power. Let's shift it to the power of love, intuition, unity, consultation, collaboration, humility, encouragement and support. So um, at the moment, the Mosman Park Council members, the Board of Management and the CEO are really hands-on involved with the women's initiatives in Mon Mosman Park. And they're quite encouraging and generous with their time and resources. So what we've noted in the last few years, trust and cooperation 
and collaboration has been strengthened with every interaction. Spaces are open alongside for us to learn alongside each other everywhere. So they can come to my home, we go to their boardrooms, they come to the park and meet the women. It's really important that we have a collective unity of vision, purpose and action in our endeavors. And I just want to note financial means is only one aspect of this relationship. We need a shift in culture, in attitudes, language, and qualities so we can advance the role of women in communities and society at large. So the question is, how do we foster this culture where there is an environment, where the relationship interaction between the three protagonists, individuals, community, and institutions is strengthened and growing? We also draw heavily on the qualities of cooperation and mutual assistance as a basis for how our society advances and progress. I recall a meeting with the deputy mayor and the mayor, and they were saying, we love what you ladies are doing. We'll step aside, we'll support you financially, give you what you need, but you just will just stay out of your way. And it was at that one point I said, we don't want you out of the way. We want you shoulder to shoulder with us. We're here to learn together about the role of women. We're here to consult and continue building on this learning process. So now, friends, I invite you to reimagine our role in building gender equal societies, whereby societies are characterized with hope, justice, equality, inclusion, collaboration, support, and joy, trust, and unity. Thank you so very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Fariba. Um, Beatrice uh, had to leave to a, another engagement, but really we brought everyone here together so that we can have a meaningful exchange of thoughts. So that's what we would really like to open up the floor. Um, one question that was really running through my mind as I heard the experiences from, from the friends online and also in this room is what does it look like for institutions of all kinds to actually prioritize gender equality rather than just accommodate for it? And also if, if gender equality is, is a priority that is alongside others, what does it look like to advance with gender equality as a priority and other priorities? I just offer that as a thought, as a starting thought, but please, um, if there are any questions or any comments, this is a space that we really wanted to create for, for people to exchange um, meaningful dialogue. I'm happy to jump into the breach if it's okay that I speak twice. Um, I was very touched by what Viganya shared. Um, and actually, I, I would like to yes and it if I, if I could. Because as I was thinking, I was imagining the, the gentleman, the pain that he must have been in, the suffering that he may have experienced in his life. What is it about our society, its treatment of mental health, and perhaps not unlikely the abuse that he received when he was younger. I mean, these are generational things. And of course, the, like the heartbreaking story is, is about the daughter and the mother, like absolutely, which is why it's a yes and, no, no buts here. But it makes me think about how we conceive of masculinity and femininity, what, how we identify like the, the true pernicious challenges that we're facing. It's not just about having more of one, per, one type of person or another type of person on a panel. It's about finding ways that we can all express those qualities of the, the human being, the, the sensitivities, the, the sadness and the joy, the, the love and all, all of these things. And there are many of these qualities men are encouraged not to express, which causes tremendous anxiety in them, which then find expression through forms of violence, unfortunately. And so gender equality, I think is, a, and, and I've heard it many times during the CSW, so I'm not, I'm not saying anything that's unknown. But it makes me think once again about gender equality being a humanity problem, whereas it's often treated as a, a women's problem. 
um, to solve, which is a, an absolute absurdity. And you know, this example, you know, how do we tell the stories also of the suffering of, of everybody in ways that can allow us to truly solve the problems that, that we're all confronting? And I, I speak as somebody, you know, the, the, the son of a, a father with mental health issues and you know, a mother-in-law with uh, domestic abuse history. Like this is all very, very near and dear. And I think probably everybody in this room has some connection to it. And I think these stories uh, are human stories and we have to broaden our vision of, of what we're talking about when we say the equality of men and women to ensure that we're not just trying to bring women to the place where men are because men are not in a good place either. So we all have to find a new place and we don't know what that looks like. And I think that's something we can co-create together. Thank you, Dan. Second, uh, um, so uh, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting question um, and to ask what what does it look like to prioritize gender equality. Uh, I think reflecting on um, the communities that I worked with, which were primarily low income communities, uh, racialized women, migrant women, women that didn't have immigration status. Um, uh, I think what is important is trust building and for survivors to have, have a level of trust in the institutions uh, and the in system actors that they are reaching out to for support. And I think without that trust, that, uh, that epidemic of gender-based violence breeds and breeds, and it's something that keeps getting pushed to the private and the domestic realm, um, and it creates really significant barriers for women to seek support, to pick up the phone um, and call you know, a helpline or call the police or call a friend or disclose it to their doctor. Um, in the context of um, you know, racialized communities, I think you know, part of the problem and, and you know, as a lawyer, what I see is that when survivors meet with me, sometimes they see me as part of the legal system. Um, which I am, but they, they kind of equate me as, especially if they've had negative experiences in the past with the legal system, like let's say with, with police or you know, maybe they've been in family court before. Um, so they, they kind of see me as an extension of that. Um, and I do have to manage uh, sometimes, you know, uh, survivors being frustrated with me or I have to basically build trust with them. And it's a process that takes time. Um, and I think for, for racialized communities, especially black communities and indigenous communities in Canada who have been over-criminalized, who have been really penalized by the system. I mean, there's so many reports. Our uh, Ontario Human Rights Commission has issued reports on, um, even if we just look at child protection and the child welfare, se welfare sector, uh, black children are four times more likely to be apprehended and taken away from their parents uh, than other children. So that sort of, historic relationship uh, and that historical trauma, uh, I think really impedes um, that trust building. If, if we look at indigenous women and girls in Canada, they have the highest rates of gender-based violence. And the rates are so high, in fact, that indigenous communities, indigenous leaders have said that this should be declared a national emergency, the rates at which these, these indigenous women and girls are being killed. Um, and that's part of an ongoing process of, of colonization. Uh, so I, I do really feel like that is something that has to be addressed. Um, people who are accessing the institution need to have some sort of trust uh, that the system will take care of them, that the system will not re-traumatize them, that the system will not dismiss their experiences of abuse and assault. Um, so I think what I try to do at an individual level with, with clients and, you know, um, make them feel safe and comfortable. Um, I think that kind of has to be somehow replicated on an institutional level. Yeah. Thank you. Please try. I'd just like to share some experiences, make some comments. And it's wonderful to see uh, Fariba. I'm from Perth, Fariba. <laughs> from Perth, Western Australia, sitting in New, New York and say hi to Lorraine, it's Jaya Dantas. So good to see you, Lorraine, up there. We were both on the ESHAR board uh, 
together a few years ago. Um, I, I wanted to share my experiences of, of living and working in Africa, in the post-conflict countries of Uganda and then Rwanda, and where people were rebuilding lives and institutions after conflict, after protracted conflict in Uganda and the genocide in Rwanda. So then women experienced conflict in a very different way because um, they had in Uganda, it was 20 years of poor leadership. And in Rwanda, it was the genocide. And you know, both Shirley and I have worked in Rwanda and have um, work with institutions, educational institutions. But one of the things that we found is people were committed to rebuilding their country. And one of the things, underlying things that they wanted was peace. So when they said they had peace and security and safety, could they work together to actually build that? And I think using rights-based rights, rights -based approaches was, was quite vital. So, um, I worked with the Aga Khan Development Network in Uganda for four years and was rebuilding institutions that had been destroyed during the Idi Amin era. So basically, people had gone through that trauma of conflict. You know, people disappeared, students disappeared. It was a terrible time in Uganda, and it was post that time. It was also the time of the HIV pandemic. It was also the time of the end of apartheid in South Africa. So all of these events were taking place in Africa. And but people were rebuilding the institutions, you know, after the decimated. So one of the things that I found is people constantly talked about peace and safety and security, both men and women. And both men and women were engaged in rebuilding institutions in both these countries. Now, after those, I again I went, I live in Australia now. I'm originally from India. And in in Australia, I've been part of the foster care system as as a South Asian foster carer. So they were not, I was the first Southeastern for foster carer in Western Australia. So these were people who had experienced, so I fostered children who had experienced, whose families had experienced domestic violence and mental health issues. So they had the trauma. So, and I work at a university where my students research issues of domestic violence and all of that. But one of the things that, again, it came out is that in, in, in countries like Australia, which are safe, safe countries, strong institutions, strong government policies, even navigating systems when it comes to family law, domestic violence is challenging for, for people. And I think one thing that I just wanted to share is that how, how we, as those with education and privilege, can support each other. I think, I mean, I have, uh, you know, in, I must say, in Uganda and in Rwanda, I met with the Baha'is in, in those countries that you're talking about, you know, 20, 30 years ago, long time ago, and same way in Western Australia. But what, what we see is working together again to help each other um, rebuild institutions at different levels. It could be at the family level, it could be at the community level, it could be at the education level, and how one can do that. Mm -hmm. So just like um, Ghania, uh, I have examples of you know, murder-suicide, about loss of uh, a mother. So where the mother passed away and uh, due to a homicide committed by her partner. So mm -hmm. the children came into care and came to live with me. So this, this happens and the trauma of actually rebuilding their lives and becoming young adults who might have to testify against a parent is really challenging. So those are um, complex situations when conflict is involved. Mm -hmm. So there was conflict at the state level in Uganda, there was conflict at, among tribes in Rwanda, and there's family conflict with some of what you've shared. So I just wanted to share these things. Thank you. What you just shared reminded me of um, what Dan was saying about, and also what you shared, Ghania, around the importance of trust. That actually, how do we build trust, especially when it's been broken in the context of conflict? And the, the conflicts that are around the world today are so pervasive, it's very difficult. It's almost, you don't even want to trust what's on the television. 
But I think that this idea that I'm curious to sort of learn more about is in order to build trust, you give trust. Very different to the way the development of qualities is, is conceptualized in society. I wonder. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. It's you. No, I think uh, on to your point, I think you have to build reciprocal relationships, build on trust. And for that, you have to be respectful. Mm -hmm. And so I really appreciated the comments around uh, Indigenous women because in Canada, Indigenous women are 12 times more likely to be missing or murdered than any other woman in Canada. So Oftentimes we look at Canada institutions like Canada as a gold standard, but I think, and so oftentimes, you know, the institutions understand the issue, right? So in terms of there is a national action plan in Canada for missing murder indigenous women, whatever it falls short is implementation. And I think that is the issue in terms of how do you actually implement? So I'm looking at our institution of the UN. We, it's, it's everyone saw five men, you know, up there speaking. So what was interesting to speak to when they spoke around gender parity, right? It was one of the opening remarks, but that's why, you know, looked at the infographic at the UN, but how is that actually implemented? And I think that was kind of symbolic actually to happen here in the UN at the CSW, because it actually is a true representation in terms of what women face across the globe in terms of the implementation of gender parity, the implementation of safety within institutions. And I think where things fall short is what you need is long-term sustainable funding for the organizations who are doing work on the ground. Oftentimes you need systemic change. It's very difficult to do for organizations when they get funding, project-based funding, one year, two year. How are you supposed to retain staff? Mm -hmm. And how do you retain female staff in those sectors? You cannot do that with project-based funding. I think if we want to actually take action, long-term sustainable funding like institutions get, long-term Backdoor funding, and I, I appreciate, you know, the folks from Global Affairs, a lot of organizations get funded by Global Affairs. They don't have to go through the same process in terms of organizations like myself in Canada, where you have to actually provide, apply every single year for funding for staff that you're trying to retain who are working on critical issues like gender-based violence or policy or advocacy, and you're trying to retain staff. And then you start to compete because these structures actually create competition. So then you have who can create the best prop proposal writer. You're competing for proposal writers. You can't afford them, but you're competing for them. And then you're fighting for the staff. Like, especially now post COVID, it's been difficult for every organization, government, non-government to retain recruit staff. Now imagine doing that with project-based funding. You can't get contract, it's very difficult. So I work at the Ontario Native Women's uh, or, uh, Association. It's the oldest, largest indigenous women's organization in, in Canada, I'm an ally. I am a settler who works at the organization. Um, I've worked on both sides. So I bring that from the government perspective and now I work at an NGO. So I understand both systems. And I think it's been eye-opening for me to see after like almost 20 years in government to see what agency stays on the ground. Mm -hmm. So now I feel like I must speak to these things. Being the person at one point who was the person who was sending these lovely proposals out there to fill out about the impact to actually agencies it takes, the effort it takes to sustain mm -hmm just the work that you're doing on the ground. Thank you. I, I wanted to turn to our, our friends that are participating virtually, if they had anything to, to add or to hear from our panelists. If you'd like to jump in on any of the questions, please feel free. <laughs> Can I, is it okay if I jump in? Yes. Lovely, thank you. Um, Thank you for everyone who's who's spoken. You've got my mind thinking about how, like on a on a wide scale, to address the, the gender inequity that we see in institutions. Um, what I found in in the classroom setting is the more that that our young people understand the process of colonization, and it 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 opened the door for patriarchy to come in in its form that we see it in. It opened the door for gender norms, and when they start to learn and recognize that for, for most indigenous people around the world, men were wearing skirts. Men had long hair, men had ornamentations, they had earrings, they had rings. They, these gender norms, especially when it comes to dress and, and behavior were not, were not something that was traditional to us. And so when they start to see the larger picture of what colonization has done and how it's normalized gender norms and assumptions around um, how women and men are supposed to behave, or that there are just men and women, that there isn't, you know, that there isn't 
more choice, there isn't more ways that people can represent themselves, that it really opens the door for them. So for me, that piece around the education piece, I've seen uh, you know, young people who identify as males in my classroom setting really start to question who, why they believe they can't cry, why they believe that they can't participate. Um, it, it is it is concerning to see that students who sign up for an Indigenous Studies course or a social justice course, they're predominantly women. There are very few men who choose to be in those spaces on their own volition. And that, um, as we are trying to achieve balance, I am maybe not concerned. I'm not too worried about those boys. <laughs> yeah, they can deal with themselves. But I am aware that they are lack of mentorship for them. I don't know. I grew up in the 90s. I had the Spice Girls. That that was enough for me <laughs> to, to emancipate me to where I am. But then when I ask young men who are your mentors, there are, you know, there are names that we could throw out of men who are making their names well known and boys are watching them and looking to them for guidance who are have horrific uh, misogynistic messages that these young men are absorbing. So not to take away at all attention from what we're the intent of this this meeting to empower young women and to, to, to achieve gender equity. With that, though, some attention to how to engage young men in this in this space to be those servers, to be the ones who are offering um, offering their talents to the community in a way that's meaningful. Thank you. Thank you, Jelena. I saw another hand. Is that still covered? Okay. Yes. Tiara, good afternoon. Um, listening to the conversations, one of the hardest things is around the. Oh, sorry. My name is Carolyn Savage. I'm from Business and Professional Woman International here, and I am in New York, but I'm in another space, so I couldn't get to you. But. One of the important things is around that language in the education. So when we talked, to, there was a discussion with one of the speakers around um, what happened in the courts. The judges didn't understand the ramifications for the cases that they were supporting or the cases that they were reading. So we've had some changes in the New Zealand law process and we've had changes where the victims can now participate online. They don't have to be in the same room as the perpetrators because they were looking at how they could actually help the process. But the other thing that said, like I'm a mother, I've had two sons, and it is important you as an individual must have the power of your own convictions to be able to apologize if you're wrong. And it, it was what goes back to what Dan said earlier, if we can't apologize, how do we hope the next generations to learn to apologize if they've made a mistake? So again, it's that language. But one of the things that has come out recently is there's so much on the internet. There is so much information that's misinformation. And it's actually that education is really important. Because if we don't give the right information or right knowledge behind what's been said, we're still going to go down the same tracks. We won't achieve the SDGs, but we're not going to take people along on the journey as well. So I think that's really important. So sorry about the background noise, but um, and I'm really sorry that I wasn't with you all today in the room, but I think this, this is really important. And having gone through to universities and seen some of the challenges that the women are facing in the teaching space, it ha there has to be some new language that's brought to the table as well. I hope that has helped and thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you, Carolyn. Well, I just wanted to make a point um, on what Daniel mentioned before, uh, with men having mental health issues. Um, my name is Helena, I'm actually from Australia and I work in family violence sector. I also have worked in the family law court, not as a lawyer, but as a first worker where I actually supported women who were experiencing family violence, but they had to attend the court hearings and having the family law court orders uh, or proceedings. Now the problem is we have leveled men so strong that they are not, they shouldn't cry, they shouldn't 
they should behave in certain ways and uh, we have leveled them so hard that it is so challenging and hard for them to seek support. Now in Victoria, we have got a lot of support uh, programs for men who are like, you know, doing uh, committing family violence. We have got programs for them to come and attend, change their behavior, change their belief system, and also understand the power imbalance that we have within the family homes. The, ch the real challenge and struggle is that men are not engaging. And it's, it's a taboo for some of the communities for men to seek support. And I facilitate men's behavior change program, which is in culture, in language, just to actually, to take that barrier away. We are providing support systems in language, in culture, by people who are with from the community. Even having those specific programs, we are really struggling to engage men. Now, that this is the real uh, challenge. How can we engage men in those support services or support system where we can have a better gender equality, a better understanding of like, you know, the issues that women are facing and how men can make the best out of the support systems, which are freely available, accessible to them through case management support and also like, you know, discuss their mental health issues. And then they can be referred to mental health services. The problem is men are not engaging and it's, it's not the responsibility of services. It's a societal responsibility where everyone has to take a role in addressing this issue, men and women alongside each other, that's how we can we can bring gender equality. So I, I've sort of sat quietly and listened, and I'm very grateful for what I've heard. But I'm just reminded from Helena's talk as well by a question that arrived on my WhatsApp when I arrived in New York. Oh, sorry. I have to introduce myself. My name is Juliana. <laughs> my name is Juliana Mkuma. I come from Australia and I am the manager. My title at work, and David, you talked about Daniel, he talked about titles and said it's not titles. But sometimes the system has made it that we, we introduce ourselves to that. My title is Manager Gender Equality and Women's Safety in Settlement Services International. And we work with migrant and refugee women in Australia. So, the, But the question I'm bringing to this forum is a question that landed on my WhatsApp when I arrived here from another woman, I'm of Ghanaian background, from another Ghanaian woman in Australia who knows that I'm not completely physically well and just was amazed that I was making this journey. And the question was, why are you doing it? When in Australia, we black mothers are struggling, we black mothers of boys. So I have two girls and a boy, and they're all adults now. So I'm like, but I struggle <laughs> for my son. I, I struggle all the time for my son, for him at work, for him driving on the road only because our black children are targeted, our black men and boys are targeted. Whether we like it and, and our, she's gone. Uh, oh no, she, Lorraine is here. You know, our, our black children are targeted whether we like it or not. We've had situations in Melbourne about um, black guys, whether they exist or not, we don't know. So women are beginning to feel really frustrated and scared about what is going to happen to my son, what's going to happen to our son. So what I said to this good friend of mine is, of course, we come in here to talk about gender equality. I will find spaces to put this information wherever I can. But when I get back home, I will find a way where we will bring a group of us Black mothers with, with boys together so we can have a voice in the right places in Australia and begin to in connect with other people in diaspora 
around the world in the same circumstances so we can bring a voice of our situation, our boys' situation through our mother's voices back to CSW. Mm. Because the only way we can get that change happening is if we can work with ourselves together, collaborate with other people in diaspora and bring those voices here because those mothers, us who are black boys, are struggling because we don't have spaces to put our issues. We still haven't found spaces to put our issues. And yet our kids can't get out there and feel confident. My son came from Australia to New York and the first thing he said when he arrived here was, mom, I feel so comfortable here because nobody's gawking at me. Yeah, even though we know there are issues here as well. Yeah, so I think this is these are some of the things that we people are calling on us to do in the face of looking for gender equality. Why are you traveling to do this when right there at home there are issues that you should be also looking for? Thank you, Juliana. I think um, places like CSW really allow us to um to be able to be voices for for people back at home and i hope that the insights that we've shared today um are able to stimulate more thought and give us more energy for when we go back you know, just, uh, yes yes i think you want to speak I think oh sorry was there someone online yeah elizabeth oh elizabeth sorry i was just looking at the time but please so sorry, I'm I, I I'm just an old academic uh, health professional, and I have a struggle with um <laughs> with technology. Um, but I just have a couple of things. One of the things I want to call back to Jelena's uh, point about power over, power to, and power with, um, mm -hmm. and just underline that because uh, what when I hear the 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 notion of power with, that calls to me. The notion of you of 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 equality, it's balance and equality and harmony, and those are the threads that I think that we really really need to focus on, no matter what gender, or ethnicity, or race, or issue that there is, that we are all humans first, not gender first, and that and that if we if if no matter what we're talking about, we we focus on um balancing all of these issues and making everybody um work together and communicate together and cons and consult i think that that is one of the um the ways that we can walk through this d dilemma otherwise we just we just you know end up on that teeter totter that balances back and forth and um and sometimes you're up and sometimes you're down and um, and really, what we need to do is we need to be equally balanced. Yeah. And oh, and one more thing. I also, um, when we're talking about gender, we must not forget the gender diverse people among us as well. You know, and um, uh, and bring them forward too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm really glad that I didn't accidentally missed you because that was a really important point um and and friends i i am looking at the time so i i do need to to bring today to a to a close but i just what you shared just before elizabeth really did make me think you know in exploring today's event and in creating it um we really wanted to look at that relationship between individuals and institutions, because if there's one thing that we've learned over the last few years, particularly the pandemic, is the very human element of relationships, which the world really functions on. We've increasingly realized how interconnected and interdependent we are, and as humans, we relate to each other very much through relationships, um, and gender equality will be achieved through stronger relationships, not just amongst ourselves, but between the private sector and multilateral forums, the public sector um, and, and institutions of various kinds. So I just wanted to say, this is the end of the event, but hopefully not the end of the conversation. <laughs> um, but please, um, I wanted to also thank our speakers, Beatrice, Gania, um, my co-moderator, Andrea, Dan, Haribo, Jelena for joining us. Friends from Australia, I know it's very early for you. 
thank you for joining us. Um, and on behalf of Andrea and myself, we'd like to thank all of you for also coming today. Um, different spaces bring different things, but we really just hope that this would be a, a point of reflection in what can be a very busy space to really think more deeply about this concept of reimagining the relationships that we have. And we hope you have a wonderfully rich CSW experience and it energizes you as you travel back home. Um, please enjoy the refreshment